two main ideas I want to go over real quick uh, reading this physics book. Now, in the back, it says physics 101, the basics. And it says, uh, what is energy? We all know energy is a concept. There's your answer. It's a concept. Because it's so different everywhere. You have acoustic energy, you have radiant energy, you have electrical, you have thermal energy, kinetic energy, chemical energy, nuclear, and potential energy. Now, through all those different types of energies, what we can do is figure out how those energies are related to stellar evolution itself, which is basically my main theory. I know I wrote a beginning uh, paper on it, but I need to learn how to organize it better. And then what I'm going to do is start branching off of those specific ideas and focusing on them so I can start organizing a larger text. And that's going to be a lot of work, but I think by organizing it, I'm going to get a lot more done instead of just willy-nilly all over the place like I'm doing right now. And took one of my dad's old school books. It says, what every engineer should know about finite element analysis. See, copyright date on this is, uh, what do we have here? Copyright date, copyright date. 1988 and I was reading through it yes I read these books <laughs> is on page 10 I got one hell of a clue as to why establishment doesn't have evolutionary models for Jupiter it doesn't have evolutionary models for Neptune or Uranus or Saturn they don't even have an evolutionary model for the earth itself why? And one of the main things, the reason why they don't have these evolutionary models is because of the idea of variable subtraction. You have mathematicians that want to solve for a certain given set of equations, and the way you make it easier is by subtracting variables and making them equate to zero. That way you can ignore them and they can toss them off to the side. And those variables inside of stellar evolution and planet formation are the evolution of the energy states of that object itself. Such as Jupiter has more energy than Neptune. Neptune has more energy than the Earth, you know. They want to subtract the energy states so they can solve for different functions and give the object a static structure and to where it's not dynamic or changing at all and on page 10 even in an engineering book I found out where they screw up and they subtract a reality from the equations it says here energy functional minimum minimization so basically they take the energy they try to take the energy variable out changing levels of energy out of the equations that's very bad the way finite element analysis obtains the temperatures, stresses, fields, or other desired unknown parameters in the, in the finite element model is by minimum, minimizing an energy functional. An energy functional consists of all the energies associated with a particular finite element model. So they do that so they can... <laughs> so they can take measurements of something inside of a little box. They want to place everything in a little box. But what they don't realize is that that very abstraction of the changing levels of energy inside that system means that you will not have higher understanding of what that system is actually doing. Now granted, an I-beam isn't going to evolve into a... Uh, I don't know, a rock, you know, so it makes sense for them to do that. Like a steel I-beam, it's not going to transform into a rock. But when you have 
evolutionary models concerning stars, you have gaseous structure and gaseous material, which does chemically react with other material, and it does deposit over time onto the surface of a aging star in this in its center, forming land. So yes, the level of energy change is apparent as gas deposition at higher temperatures and pressures. But what happens is, is these mathematicians, they take these models and they subtract reality from them to make the model work. And that kind of attitude is pervasive in both the engineering sciences as well as astronomy, astrophysics, and all that stuff. Basically what happens is they take math and they go overboard with it. If they just realize it is that as exacting as the math is, it doesn't model reality. The two are not hand in hand. The more exacting you get with the math doesn't mean you're more exacting in reality. It's actually the opposite. The more exacting with the math, the less it has to deal with reality. So yeah, there's a big there's a big issue with that. And of course that flies in the face of modern um, arguments for solving the mysteries we have is that if you don't understand the math, you can't understand nature. No. You can understand very complex ideas in nature, such as the momentum of, of a car when you drive it, you know? You really, do you really th you know how complicated the math formulas would be for explaining how the pressure changes in the, in the car's tires as it rolls down the road? Or the energy dissipation of the gases that come out of the engine and what kind of heat comes out. I mean, the the math formulas for that would be incredible, but intuitively you can instantly get it. Because your brain is a supercomputer, essentially. But I'm going to find more of my dad's books and look for more clues as to how things ended up the way they did inside of astronomy and astrophysics and geophysics but basically there are a lot of clues out there if you can learn how to spot them and I suggest for my readers to spot those clues as well and to learn where they made the big mistakes the big uh, assumptions that have gotten in the way of discovery and insight today is July 1st 2015